What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 232 at block height 642,808 on Saturday, August 8th. And you know how I know that? Because I have a node for Bitcoin that I can run, you know, affordably on my own hardware that can do neat things like check the total outstanding supply of Bitcoin. Isn't that cool, guys? Yeah, uh, I mean, when I uh, when I checked, also oh, we are on episode two thirty two. <laughs> Amazing that it's easier to uh, verify the Bitcoin block height or the Block Digest episode height <laughs> than it is to figure out how many ether exist. And of course, this is the instant that somebody decides to pester me. Um, but yes, ignoring other communications platform. Um, yeah, I mean, it is such like that whole situation is so fucking hysterical to me. I mean, like somebody had to make a custom script to tally up the outstanding ETH. That's not just a, a default thing. Yeah. Um, and I also believe I saw Vitalik claim that um, supply caps are central planning. Yep. Which I believe is very similar to an argument that he made in 2018 that, um, what was it? Bitcoin maximalism is like a dictatorship, which funnily enough was the same thread where he made that uh, famous uh, tweet. <laughs> Uh, about whether property can be 80% respected, and then I replied, what if consent is consistently 80% respected? Still haven't gotten an answer, have you? No, no, Vitalik is uh, still broken, apparently. But yeah, have, um... Have we tried resetting him lately? Uh, I, d I don't know. Um, I would have to check that. But um, coincidentally, I was actually listening to um, an episode of what Bitcoin did with, it's like another company that started recently to, I think they're working on a node, but they're trying to do a lot of other stuff besides just Bitcoin. And um, they actually mentioned that they uh, used to, they all came from Salt. And I guess at Salt, they were saying that they had to run an Ethereum node. And so they got to see firsthand what that experience was like specifically their devops person uh got to experience what that was like and how you know they were trying to um they were trying to reach out to people in the ethereum community saying like um hey you know if our node ever goes down it would be nice that if we could just you know call you up and get some help with that and they quickly found out that <laughs> yes that is a cat um they quickly found out that almost no one runs an ethereum node because it's too hard Yep. It's a special kind of cognitive dissonance. Like I, I got into it with somebody on Twitter um, who just kept going back and forth about that. And it's just like when, when you design a system that's based on users being able to validate it, that act of validation is in fact, cumulatively, a market force. I mean, it's like, wow. Decentralization theater. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. Um, I guess before we dive into the stories, th there's one thing that I kind of wanted to touch on um, from the last episode regarding the Twitter hack. Um, it, it's kind of evolved now from just media outlets asserting 
that Graham Clark is the mastermind to this without citing anything to um, citing actual affidavits that are nowhere to be found directly or cited um, in none of the publications actually doing this um, as a basis for putting him as a mastermind. And, you know, one specific one was a, an article from The Verge where they actually directly quote a snippet of this supposed affidavit and then link to all the affidavits involved um, at the end of the article, which is only the two um, filed in Northern California, um, one of which doesn't even mention um, Clark or the, the minor, um, as he was referred to in the other affidavit and the indictments. Um, and like, it's a little wackadoodly weird because in the indictment, um, the minor, which was never identified is specifically, um, mentioned as being referred to the 13th circuit court in, uh, Florida, which is where Graham Clark is being charged. And none of those affidavits, um, mention any kind of evidence related to him or tying him to this beyond a statement of a belief that he was a party who aided Kirk in the selling of um, names that were stolen. And like, really the only thought I can think here is that that affidavit is sealed. In which case the questions are, why are these media outlets getting access to it? And why is it still sealed given that they've actually indicted Clark in the 13th Circuit Court um, publicly for numerous charges? So why would they keep the affidavit as the basis of that seal? Like, it, it's that there are enough connecting threads here to definitively associate Clark as the minor in the original um, two affidavits filed in Northern California and the indictment. But despite all of these claims of an affidavit attesting that he in fact was Kirk himself and pulled this attack is, is nowhere to be found. It's, it's kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, it, it looks like they're in a way trying to disappear Kirk by muddying the waters about who he is. So, yeah, sounds really suspicious. It was also kind of suspicious how quickly a lot of media people even knew the kid's name to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I just kind of want to throw out like the exact specific chain there. And it's like if an affidavit winds up getting unsealed at some point, like, okay. Um, but if it doesn't, then this is it's just still massive levels of weird and just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, want to jump into a much bigger pile of weird. Are we talking about the American firewall? Mm -hmm. So, um, Michael Pompeo, out of the State Department issued um, an expansion of the Clean Network Program um, following up the decision to ban TikTok by executive order. And woo-wee are the, uh, the five directives here a uh, fucking doozy. Um, so the first one is um, to maintain clean carriers. In other words, to um, make sure that U.S. telecommunications networks um, are not directly peered with any um, Chinese or CCP-operated telecommunications networks. So, as long as they're peered with the NSA, they're good. Yeah, so that's um, major topological consequences for the Internet. Um and questions of how exactly do you go about that? Um, the clean store, which is obviously no CCP apps in Western um, app stores. Then there's clean apps. 
Um, Western companies shouldn't be able to, say, distribute their apps through the Huawei App Store. And then there's the clean cloud, um, which would prevent U.S. Um, personal information or business IP from being stored in any um, Chinese-related cloud infrastructure. And then um, clean cable, um, which probably is is the gist of they're going to start crawling all of the undersea fiber cables um, looking for any kind of tapping into them specifically coming from china so yeah um this is pretty much all the levels of substantial internet um layers um being clipped between the us and china <clears throat> Sounds like exactly the sort of thing that Mike Pompeo would put out. Well, I mean, the, as, as far as I'm concerned, this is signaling that the U.S. wants to jump on board um, the same, you know, stage that China and, and Russia recently moved into with their um, kill switch to completely isolate um, Russian infrastructure from everything out of the country. Um, at the drop of a dime, um, and start balkanizing the internet. Well, let's just say that this is uh, another example in the long history of various wall building, whether actual walls or digital walls, where the person building the wall claims that it's being built to protect the people inside, when in actuality, a lot of the reasons it's being built are also just to control the people who are inside and not to protect them. F very famously, the Berlin Wall was actually, uh, in German, it was named the Anti-Fascist Protection Wall or something like that, um, because they believed they were keeping the fascists out of, out of Berlin by building this wall, when actually they were just trying to keep people in at the end of the time that it was up and then the Chinese firewall also they claim to be protecting um, the Chinese section of the internet and Chinese citizens and they also prevent their own citizens from accessing content that is not dangerous uh, well it's not dangerous in you know the the cyber sense but it is dangerous to their ideology in terms of you know free software that is not participating in the surveillance system and written materials that are not a uh, party to the ruling government and so i expect this kind of network wall to fall into the same category just because it's the us doesn't mean that it's going to be very much different mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is really <clears throat> kind of the inevitable direction. Um, I was worried that all of this this bickering about social media censorship, um, you know, even, even you know, and that's even crept into things like domain registrars. I mean, t 2017, um, Stormfront had their DNS revoked. And yeah, they're ignorant piece of shit neo-Nazis, but, you know, that was a fucking big red flag. And now oh, the State Department I... is taking advantage of this entire situation with us in China and the the varying degrees of not outright warfare going on um, to really push that home. Yeah, just a little anecdote because you brought up Stormfront. Um, one of one of my favorite talks from was it thirty. 34C3? Yes, 34C3. I think it was in 2018. Um, one of my favorite talks from that conference was about the World Check database, which I've recently tweeted about because I think not, not enough people have seen that talk. Um, and one of the most interesting parts of the World Check database, which is basically this, this uh, it's a list of politically exposed persons. And when you hear that, you think, ooh, it's like baddie people, it's political people. Um, but actually, that's not the case. There's a lot of people in the World Check database that are simply relatives of politicians. And when I say politicians, I, that includes local politicians who have 
no criminal record or allegations against them. It's just because they're politicians and so their family is in this database. And that database is basically used by banks and governments um, who subscribe to it that this is a person they should look more closely at when they're opening a bank account or something. And one of the favorite sources of the World Check database, which is now maintained by a, uh, well, it's a combination of Thomson Reuters, which was the original owner, and also a a very, very big venture capital firm called Blackstone Group. Um, One of their favorite sources for compiling profiles of people to put into World Check was Stormfront. (laughs) So if you ended up in some Stormfront article, uh, your name might just appear in the World Check database on that basis that, you know, you... Uh, it was especially, obviously, because given the focus of Stormfront, it was often um, people of color who were being highlighted by Stormfront for probably nefarious reasons. And so they would end up on World Check because that was a source for them. So it's really ridiculous because, you know, when you get into World Check, that means you're going to possibly have trouble opening bank accounts. You may have existing bank accounts shut. Um, you're just going to face extra scrutiny. It's just going to be hell. And the other interesting part is that World Check prevents their subscribers, the banks and other organizations, from telling their customers that that um, that they are on this list. So if you get excluded from opening a bank account, they can't tell you it's because you're in World Check. So it's hard to even figure out that you're on the list. Um, so it's very, very bizarre. Just wanted to bring that was kind of a long anecdote, but I thought I would mention it. I mean, it just goes to show like how <clears throat> well laid the the foundation for shit like this clean network program are. And I mean, it's like you, you should just see at a glance with what they're trying to do, how full of shit they are. Like if if they there are really legitimate concerns about this why isn't the state department um tasking nsa engineers with improving network security like not not sticking back doors and things to spy on people but hardening those systems why don't they have open source engineers out in the open contributing to things like android or linux to find exploits and harden them out in the open where it's auditable to improve security for users of those devices in, in this country like you know apps why aren't why isn't the nsa um auditing and publishing open audits of apps like this that have backdoors or are collecting malicious things like why are they not doing things out in the open to allow individual american citizens access to tools to protect themselves from these things themselves because they're full of shit and that's not their interest here yeah that that would also directly impede their main interest which is domestic surveillance so hardening devices for americans it's like yes we could do that but then how would we spy on them ourselves <laughs> It's like they they want to compete with China's ability to spy on us or any other intelligence agency's ability to spy on us, but they don't want to prevent themselves from being able to do that. So they have a little bit of a conflict of interest there. Mm-hmm. And that's really all you should need to think through to realize how full of shit this is. All right. And I guess... Um, to Bitcoin stuff. Yeah. I just want to explicitly say here um, that I am not stating or implying any kind of direct connection with this issue and um, this program from the State Department. I just thought it was important to kind of put these two things next to each other just to illustrate the scale of threats that are still potentially on the horizon. But... um. On August 2nd, uh, Warren Tagomi noticed, um, monitoring some of his publicly listening nodes, um, that all of his incoming connection slots uh, were saturated. And this even disconnected local host connections um, plugging into his nodes on the same machine. Um, and it's really kind of just looking at the the dynamic of this somebody 
out there is, um, you know, just saturating connections. And there's really no way to know what's going on here. Um, you know, if this is some kind of just, I don't know, some service, like a chain analysis company trying to plug in and eavesdrop on transactions or somebody probing for a network partition attack. Um, there's not really any way um, to kind of assess what's going on here. But it does illustrate a lot of issues with the peer-to-peer -peer logic in Bitcoin Core. Um, especially the fact that, you know, incoming connections for a publicly listening node um, will evict and disconnect um, processes you have on that machine connected to your own node. Um, that's a big issue. Um, the fact that any node out there, um, you know, that shows better connectivity metrics um, could get prioritized over a node you specifically want to stay connected to like say uh, a person or a business or a service that you trust. And also just the idea that anybody can um, just go, hey, you're listening, I'm connecting to you. Um, and this is a, a large surface area that really needs to, you know, like I, I'm at the point where after um, Schnorr and ta or Taproot activation, um, I think that the peer-to-peer -peer network should be a bigger priority um, for a while rather than the consensus layer. Um, just because it's that is such a vulnerable attack surface when you are looking at things like nation-state level actors. And there's a litany of, of proposals to, to solve all kinds of issues here that just fell to the wayside. Like... Um, what was his name? Um, I Cal M. Um, I think he's a core developer living in Tokyo. Um, back in 2017, had an idea where for a new node to initiate a connection with you, um, it would have to perform um, some reasonable proof of work. Um, you know, that's a filter to stop malicious nodes from just saturating your entire connection and. There's no reason that you couldn't dynamically adjust that or whatever you require for a connection. Um, there's Jonas Schnelli's um, BIPs that are uh, build off a lot of ideas from Peter Woolley and Greg Maxwell, um, looking at end-to-end -end encrypting the peer-to-peer -peer layer and you know offering the potential for effectively identity keys to, you know, like you and me, Janine, could authenticate our nodes automatically to each other. And like this shit needs to be a, a huge development priority. Like if, if we're gearing up for another bull run where banks are now cleared to hold things, major institutional investors are, are still streaming in the door. Um, you know what I mean? The The scale of the game is getting bigger and we need to start thinking bigger um, and not taking for granted that Bitcoin is just magically invincible because it is a very complicated network with a lot of complicated pieces and a lot of ways to disrupt it. Maybe we should ask uh, the Ethereum client developers for some advice about this. Because, you know, they just have so much experience about connecting to each other. Ah, boy. I feel like I might just have to start adding the outstanding coin supply uh, to the intro uh, reel from now on. <laughs> well, I think because something that I noticed is that, like, Vitalik kept talking about the total supply and i i like i'm in the camp of like you should know what the to current total supply is but he he was framing it as like or I, I don't know i felt like there was kind of a conflation of like we don't know what the total supply is right now versus what the total supply is going to be and it's capped and it's like 
there's a very big difference. You should be able to figure out how many units of a currency currently exist, whether or not you have a cap where the supply ultimately stops growing. Those are two different things. So for him to be saying like, oh, having a supply cap is centralized is centralized governance or some stupid shit like that. It's like, that's not the argument that we're making here. The main problem is you can't even figure out how many ether exist. So that's something that I just noticed in all of the discussion going on is like, you should be figuring out why can you not definitively verify how many units exist versus supply cap debates. Like that's, I feel like that's almost separate. Yeah, I'd say that's a fair characterization. But, you know, seeing as we have very basic things like that solved in Bitcoin, let's mm -hmm. let's maybe make the peer-to-peer -peer layer a little more uh, robust against uh, the coming balkanization of the internet. <laughs> yep. Like, I... I hmm. I'm going to bet that 90% of the listeners um, are going to have no clue what the hell I'm talking about. But um, Popescu and that whole crowd um, laid out um, kind of a three-pronged prediction of Bitcoin. Um, one was that it failed. Um, the other was that it ate everything um, and hyper-Bitcoinization happened. And the other one... Um, was that effectively Bitcoin just fragmented into geopolitical regional forks um, that kind of found an equilibrium of nobody having enough proof of work to attack another one, um, but enough to kind of meaningfully defend theirs. And, you know, if, if this is if this clean network um, program really goes somewhere, it really does slip down towards the internet balkanizing, then that fragmentary possibility, um, you can't really write that out of the cards. And, you know, the only way to really prevent that um, to the degree that you can is guarantee that whatever balkanized filters start getting attached to regions of the internet, <clears throat> Bitcoin has a way to route around those. Well, I think if something like that happens, we're going to have, let's say, let's say three different Bitcoins. We're going to have, no, well, we're going to have at least a American Bitcoin, which fits within this clean network. And then we're going to have a, um, a Chinese Bitcoin, maybe, that's like, full of surveillance and fully KYC'd and everything. And then we're, well, the US one could also do that. And then we're going to have Bitcoin as it is now, which fits every other country that doesn't decide to implement stupid uh, uh, policies like that. And then, you know, Ethereum could split further. We might even have a North Korea, the, you know, Ethereum might move to North Korea. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, <laughs> It sounds silly, but if you really see internet infrastructure regionalize and filter connection points like that, I mean, that's not out of the question. I mean, I think the big problem with that is that there are now so many businesses that are dependent on having connections and partnerships with other with people in other countries, if not large portions of other countries and so that would that would severely affect global markets unless no one unless somehow we decide not to care about that i mean just filter access to things i mean like the banking system now i mean if you're holding dollars i mean ultimately that devolves to some correspondent bank in the u.s that you just have to trust i mean <clears throat> You know what I mean? The, the same well, kind of structure could evolve like that. Well, then we have to start hiding Bitcoin transactions in Doge pictures. Doge memes. <laughs> Alrighty, though. But little break from the, the pessimistic dystopia that's coming. Uh, 
you might want to take us into the next one. Yeah, so in June, uh, the Human Rights Foundation had opened a new Bitcoin development fund, which was focused on um, developers who are making the Bitcoin network more private, decentralized, and resilient, uh, with a particular focus on improving it for activists and journalists so that they can conduct their work in a censorship-resistant way. And their debut grant went to Chris Belker to work on CoinSwap, and they recently announced that their next round of grants, uh, which they made three of them worth one Bitcoin each, which was about $11,000 at the time, that has gone to the creator of JoinInBox, uh, which is OpenNOMS. Uh, JoinInBox is the graphical interface for join market that he's been working on for particularly to work on the Raspberry Blitz full node. Uh, and also the creator of Zeus, Evan Cal Cal Calotis, and uh, the creator of fully noted Fontaine. So that's really cool and good to hear. Um, I can't remember, Zeus is a lightning node and fully noted as another full node um, software, which I think ha I think I've seen an inter interface for that is really good. And um, yeah, so quote from OpenNOMS, because uh, Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin Magazine was the one that announced it this time. I think they've been announcing these through Bitcoin Magazine. And so he said, the whole point of privacy uh, is hiding in the crowd and using join market as a maker required you to dwell deep in the command line. Um, and he says he's making it easier to be a maker and that will increase liquidity and anonymity. The anonymity set available for CoinJoin significantly um, because yeah, he's working on the graphical interface for join market. So hopefully more people will join into that because uh, as he said, it's uh, the, the graphical interface is the most, uh, in his opinion, the most underdeveloped part. So hopefully that will increase um, the number of people using it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really like psyched um, to see the Human Rights Foundation like actually start branching out into grants like this because i mean it's like just point blank philosophically i think that a decent amount of the things that organizations like that advocate for um like i don't see them as rights i see them more as an entitlement or a positive right and it's just fucking kick ass that like okay um Let's just put money into making things actually happen. And, you know, from my point of view, philosophically, that is how you should approach things that aren't negative rights. Like if you want those to exist in the world and be accessible, then put them out there and make them accessible. And that's exactly what they're doing. Also should point out that this, uh, that they don't only accept, um, bitcoin into this developer fund they also accept fiat and so whichever one you choose to donate it's also tax deductible mm -hmm. that is because, another nice side yeah because what is better than uh not only donating to improving the privacy of bitcoin but but also paying uh the state less tax money here here Two birds with one stone. Bingo. Alrighty. So, yeah. Um, this next thing. Uh, so, Coin Center um, wrote an open letter to the office of the comptroller in relation to their recent ruling as far as or letter um, clarifying that banks are allowed to custody cryptocurrencies. And um, let's just, I'm going to go through all of the positive things in terms of arguments in this, but there is a doozy of a, uh, a sticking their foot in their mouth. Um, unless I am just wildly misinterpreting this, but um Pretty much they argue that there are six functions that banks should be explicitly free um, to engage in in regards to cryptocurrency services. Um, first is um, safekeeping. 
whether this actually involves, um, you know, effectively a, a safe deposit box analog um, holding a key or literally um, giving custody um, of the Bitcoin to the bank itself um, with their keys. Um, but effectively, regardless of which is being done, restrict it to a um, pretty much a safekeeping service um, in terms of uh, like a trust where they are just required to safeguard this on the trustee's behalf and have no legal authority to, you know, hypothecate any of these or loan out anything. Um, it is simply being held in a trust. And they specifically lay out the fact that, you know, actual insurance products for cryptocurrencies are almost non-existent in terms of the rationale for why banks should not be allowed at this time to do any kind of deposit taking or lending. Um, and then also multi-sig safekeeping um, in which, you know, a bank would effectively just act as a, a 2FA um, fraud prevention mechanism. Um, and I'm going to skip past for now the node operation part. That's where the doozy is. Um, they also argue that banks should be allowed to open um, things like payment channels and participate on um, things like the Lightning Network. And the rationale here is effectively that given um, no custody is actually involved, um, you know, there is no real counterparty risk in the sense of um, a bank correspondent network, which is the thing that they actually um, directly compare a payment channel network to um, and then explicitly try to distinguish it as far as the removal of, uh, you know, any meaningful counterparty risk. Um, they also go on to argue that um, privacy services, um, such as both um, the use of mixing protocols like CoinJoin on Bitcoin and um, privacy coins like Zcash or Monero should be things that banks are allowed to interact with. And they kind of spell out directly the argument <clears throat> that without using um, protocols or, or, you know, taking deposits of coins like this, that banks... Um, would effectively be leaking customers' private information publicly, which is a direct violation of things like the Banking Secrecy Act, um, but would still leave room for them to comply with legal subpoenas for information um, you know, that were legally founded. And lastly, um, they argue for um, banks to be able to accept kind of self-sovereign identity services, you know, things like, um, you know, legally recognized um, identities issued on something like Microsoft's DID protocols in lieu of directly collecting, identifying information about customers um, themselves. And they kind of make the entire argument about how siloed and unportable um, IDs are when you have institutions directly um, collecting and saving every user's private information and not really having an incentive to attest to their identity for a competitor service. Um, and, you know, these are all things that, yeah, if banks are going to get involved in this space, um, they should absolutely um, be allowed and with some of these things be required um, to engage in these activities in the provision of services to customers. But <clears throat> I think as far as the node operation section goes, um, Coin Center fucked up here um, hard um, unless they explicitly clarify this. Um, and I see um, a result coming of this in the exact same way um, you know, they're, they're bitching at the IRS to clarify things worked out. Um, it just made things worse. So obviously they argue that these institutions should be able to run a node because that's a necessary thing to, to validate deposits that they would be taking um, and secure that. And so they argue that, you know, it's, it should not be mandated 
for an institution to do so. I think it should, um, but that they should be open to do so. And th this is, is mind boggling to me. Um, I'm going to quote this exactly. Um, while no bank should be forced to perform all of these activities simply because it chooses to safe keep cryptocurrencies, banks should be free to perform these activities to the extent they remain compliant with other laws. And this is in regards to running a node. Um, for example, banks should not relay transactions to or from cryptocurrency addresses on the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control list of specially designated nationals and blocked persons list. And simple filtering rules can be employed to ensure compliance with these laws. However, if a bank is relaying transactions on the peer-to-peer -peer network between non-sanctioned addresses, it should not be obligated to obtain identifying information related to those transactions. Now, in a paragraph below this, um, they explicitly make the argument that just relaying a transaction across the peer-to-peer -peer network is not um, actually processing that transaction. Um, and what they cite is that um, there's effectively a but-for um, argument um, where if a transaction would not have occurred but for the involvement of an entity, then that entity is involved in processing that transaction. So to go back to the banks should not relay transactions to or from cryptocurrency addresses on the OFAC list, um, despite trying to argue the exact opposite, a paragraph below, they're implicitly stating here um, that relaying a transaction that they are not a party to, not involved in confirming in a blockchain, is a violation of facilitating transactions for people on the OFAC list. And now if they meant yeah. if they meant, you know, participate in a transaction, then that should read banks should not authorize transactions to an address on the OFAC list. And there's literally nothing that they can do to stop sanctioned funds from being sent to a bank address. All they can do is go, hey, government, please take this afterwards. Um, so I don't know what the fuck um, Coin Center is thinking, but they literally just equated relaying a transaction on, on the peer-to-peer -peer network as being um, a processor or liable um, for what that transaction is doing. And so all of the other like sound arguments and, and things that I agree with in this um, are just what you just negated all of that. Like, what the fuck are they doing equating that just propagating through your node on the peer to peer layer with facilitating that transaction? And just think about the slope that the comptroller's office is going to go down with that statement. Yeah. That's not good, especially because that's one of the arguments that some trolls have been making about Lightning, that by routing a payment um, that you're, if it's, you know, someone who shouldn't be allowed to make the payment and you route it, that you're processing that transaction. And so if you run a Lightning node, you should register as a, you know, money transmitter. Like that's going to it's kind of going in that direction, which is something that they were supposedly fighting against. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's like, you know, like, holy shit. If, if you guys are a lobbyist group, go to Congress and get them to pass new laws. Because it seems like every time they talk to a regulator about something substantial, they do something absolutely, utterly fucking retarded like this. And it's mind boggling. Like you are not helping Bitcoin. You are actively worsening the situation it exists in by being dumb shits who don't think through what the fuck you are saying to regulators. So cheers. I'm going to just move along before I get even more furious. Um, so just a quick, quick statement. Um, the IRS is effectively, um, 
uh, Congress is going to the IRS and have sent them a letter arguing that staking rewards uh, on proof of stake systems should not um, be taxed as income when they are collected. And now Coin Center is attempting to argue that this should apply to proof of work as well as proof of stake. Um, and really, I think this is, it's just such a, uh, I don't know. The only real benefit that this would have is at scale. Um, you would need a less upfront capital to really perform any kind of staking or mining operation at scale. Um, because any kind of income would be pushed off until the point of sale. And it really comes down to the fact that you are making income regardless of whether that is, or when that is recognized, if you are staking and mining, and you are going to be liable for capital gains based on the fair market value of when you acquired that, when you sold it. And so ultimately the cost is going to be the same in that it's just sliding around when you pay it. But I think an interesting question here is why, why is Congress trying to make this argument just for proof of stake? And, you know, I can't help but wonder if that ultimately traces back to some idiotic argument um, that people like Coin Center made to Congress um, just getting ran off with into retard land. Or lobbying by some Ethereum people, you know? Oh, you mean like the kind of dumb shit that Coin Center does? Wee! But yeah, um, that's the fun update of the stupid shit going on in the in bureaucrat land in the United States. Wee! So what is going on here, um, with this Swaparoo paper? Yeah, so someone a few days ago pointed out to me that there was a Bitcoin Monero cross-chain atomic swap paper in the works, and there was indeed one. Um, computer scientist and Monero researcher Joel Gugger, um, he goes by hash, it's spelled H4SH3D, uh, published a paper titled Monero, uh, Bitcoin Monero cross-chain atomic swap. Um, currently it's dated as August 8th, but I don't know if that's just because he's still working on it and that's the current date for when the paper was last edited, but, um, he had announced the completion of the research that went into the paper on July 31st via Reddit, and he had made a funding request for 18, uh, XMR back in may through their community crowdfunding system um although he notes in there that he actually started researching bitcoin monero atomic swaps three and a half years ago and how feasible they were and how they would work uh and then following by the monero research lab i saw someone from monero research lab respond in the reddit thread that they were reviewing the paper and the research um uh that's how i ended up seeing it because someone pointed me to the announcement that was made through the monero twitter account on august 3rd and so the intro to the paper as it currently is um in that he states that the protocol does not require time locks on the monero side nor script capabilities um, but does require two proofs of knowledge of equal discrete logarithm across the um the Edward uh, 25519 um, curve and also the, uh, I don't even know how, about, how do you pronounce, do, should I just read them off? Like how do people usually pronounce these curves? But it's the um, SECP256K1 groups and then ECDSA one time uh, verifiably encrypted signatures. And he also states that the protocol is chain agnostic and could be applied to any pair of cryptocurrencies that satisfy the basic prerequisites involved. So, for example, it could also work with Litecoin um, because it has SegWit um, and otherwise is very similar to Bitcoin. Um, he also said he was interested in looking at Monero to Mimblewimble swaps, but that's not in the works yet. And um, he also didn't get into 
he the paper doesn't include anything about like what the privacy benefits or limitations of doing cross chain swaps between Monero and Bitcoin are. And I think people I, over the years I've seen people talk about that, and I saw a person comment in the Reddit thread where this this was announced that they thought there was a risk that basically you'd only have so called dirty bitcoins being moved back and forth between um monero and bitcoin because or value uh from dirty bitcoins into monero back and forth because the people with so called clean bitcoins would be too afraid that when they take it to an exchange or any other service that does chain analysis and possibly doesn't like coin joins or any other kind of privacy technology being involved that they might flag that and then you know you're not allowed to use the service anymore um i think i've also i don't remember where i should have looked for it but i think i've seen a paper that looked at how much privacy you actually get from swapping into monero and whether that is trackable in some way but i don't remember it or how long ago it was published um but yeah also when i <clears throat> when i was looking over the paper today to um prepare for the show i actually did a pull request that already got merged to fix some small grammar spelling mistakes so woo on that yeah, i mean i personally don't really give a shit to expose myself to monero volatility for privacy gains but <clears throat> i mean this is Kind of interesting. I was just kind of flipping through the the paper while you were talking. I mean, this looks just like a like on the Monero side, they just do a multi step like uh, key share thing, kind of yeah. like the the ECDSA MPC stuff. Like this is actually pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's like yeah, it's sharing a key on the Monero side, and then on the Bitcoin side, there's a time lock. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. So it looks like um they generate the key shares on the Monero side um so that whichever mm -hmm. Bitcoin transaction confirms reveals the appropriate half of the Monero key. That is fucking yep. awesome. Yeah. Hmm. I am actually kind of curious to see if this actually gets built out and deployed who would actually make use of this because like this is actually one of the major kind of problems with Monero is there hasn't really been a trustless way to like swap in and out of it hmm. yeah I did I haven't seen any code implementation but I think the reddit post in the reddit post he said that there was it just hasn't been published yet or something I would have to check but supposedly there is an implementation of this being worked on already baller and then the paper he was talking about like whether services could use this or if it would be more of a peer-to-peer -peer thing between wallets that added it well i mean also like another thing is you know you have like sidechain sandboxes like liquid um but they're entirely built off the bitcoin code base like if you know, like it, it looks like as long as there's compatible cryptography on the other side, like you could do this on other stuff than Monero. So, I mean, like this kind of opens the door for whole new sidechain architectures without kind of removing uh, the ability to swap out um, without going through whatever gatekeeper was running it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Dope. Alrighty though. Are we ready through a sprint through all of the major hardware wallets? Yes, sprint sprint. Alrighty. So first up, um there's a new cold card firmware update. Um lottery factorings and changes. Um so they refactored and optimize um the rendering on the screen um so anybody who upgrades should notice that um, when you press a button the screen recognizes it much faster than it used to uh which is very nice in terms of user experience 
Very nice. And they've also added a new feature um, called delete PSBTs. I really like this. Um, effectively, if you set this, um, once you sign a transaction, it will blank um, and then delete all of the PSBT files and just leave um, the transaction um, finalized and signed um, named with the transaction ID to kind of limit metadata um, that might leak based on the file name. And one thing I do want to note though, um, I think um, that if you're using multi-sig um, wallets, um, you might not want to sign, or I mean, turn that feature on. I think, um, you know, the little back and forth with Rodolfo that it will, um, but like, let's say you have a two of three multi-sig transaction and you're the first participant to sign it. Um, if you have this feature on, I think this will blank, um, the PSBT, which is what you would you know, want to keep and pass around um, until it's actually signed with enough keys. Um, so you might want to take that into account if you're using multi-sig. Um, and then what are the really things? Um, the XPUB fingerprint, if you use a passphrase, is shown on the ready to sign screen. So you can see if you're in the right wallet. Um, you can now get a SHA-256 hash of any file on the SD card. Um, that's a little neat thing. And BIP85 is now on the Mark II. So that 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 is the, the cherry on top. Oh, no, wait, wait. The cherry on top is that they didn't add any shitcoin support. Duh. All right. So Speaking of shitcoin support, woo! Oh dear. So um, I think Monarch is how you pronounce it. Um, disclosed to Ledger a doozy of an issue. Um, so effectively, all of their apps um, have a field. Um, what the hell is it? Um, Whatever, I forget the, the variable name, but it's a field to um, list out the derivation paths that that application is allowed to generate keys for. Um, that restriction didn't exist for a large number of Bitcoin forks. And so effectively, um, if you had a, a malicious application um, that you hooked your ledger up to, um, such as the Ledger Live app, which at least on Mac OS is not properly signed or recognized by Apple's um, security systems and Ledger's own instructions just tell you ignore the security warning to install it. Um, mm. You could open your Litecoin app to spend Litecoin and that malicious wallet would have access to your Bitcoin keys and could provide a transaction with Bitcoin UTXOs um, and would display it as a Litecoin transaction with a Litecoin address, um, pretty much creating a situation where that app could trick you into sending your Bitcoin somewhere when you think you're interacting with your shit coins. Yay! Um, and I do want to say that at least in, in my side of things, the big criticism here is the, the glaring um, lack of authentication for Mac OS users that they directly tell in their own write-ups to bypass the security warnings for. Um, this issue in general um, is kind of a sticky thing because a lot of those fork coins or just derivative projects from the same code bases um, use the same derivation paths as um, Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of old software out there that is using non-standard paths um, for different derivatives. And so <clears throat> this is kind of um, a tricky issue from Ledger's point of view because if they just hardcore restrict um, the primary Bitcoin derivation paths to the Bitcoin app only, 
um, then it would leave funds inaccessible um, for a decent number of coins for any of their users who held those coins. And, you know, really this comes to a big architectural issue when you try to make your hardware support all kinds of shit coins. Um, you open up security holes for everything. And um, so their patch, which uh, I, I believe is out, is pretty much to just display a warning um, when any non-Bitcoin application is accessing unusual derivation paths or derivation paths that collide with Bitcoin. And I'm kind of a little confused here on how that is the patch. Um, and now with some coins, this is true. Um, but their argument is that um, there's no way for a, a hardware wallet like that to know which chain, um, you know, a transaction is for. Um, doesn't things like Litecoin have their own address prefixes? Like, aren't there little subtle things going on there? You know, that it's not going to be fully encompassing. Um, this will not apply to every single um, instance of this, but a good number of them. Yeah, there are little things um, that should have specific pieces of data in a transaction only for a single chain. Um, you couldn't build some checks like that into it and have a warning maybe reflect that. Hmm? Yeah, and also I think I think I saw, I mean, I suspect that something similar is probably going on also with Trezor, but did it, did it actually get confirmed that Trezor had a similar issue, but they had already patched it or something? Um, yeah, so that's, um, let's just slide into that. Um, Trezor has also dropped um, new firmware for both of their devices. Um, and real quick before touching on um, this issue, um, apparently the Model T didn't have an auto lock feature where it would relock the device and require your pin if you walk away. Um, the Model 1 did, but for some reason until right now, whoopsies, we, we just forgot to have a very basic security feature like that in our new Trezor Model T. So that's in there now. Um, and then, yeah, um, they were affected by this issue um, in the Trezor 1. Um, the Model T already had these checks in place, according to them. Um, and their comment on this just says, this check prevents a user from spending coins from known paths. Um, so BIP 44, 49, and 84 for Bitcoin, if the coin type does not m or match the path. So, um, yeah, they're... they're safety checking this um but an interesting thing buried in this too is um they enabled support for multiple change outputs laying the groundwork for potential enhanced privacy applications now that i, I i'm honestly not sure um what wallets out there will recognize and handle multiple change outputs properly um, if, if none of them do, then that is kind of a ecosystem wide glaring issue, but I just find it interesting how they kind of slipped in laying the groundwork for potential enhanced privacy. What, what, what potential privacy applications like simulated coin joins, which have been around for forever. Um, like what, what, what new thing, um, does enabling that enable that, that was already, wasn't already possible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you know, both like the, the, the ledger and the treasure like updates, both of this is just like, um, are you fucking kidding me for like multiple different reasons? Like I'm so agitated. I just don't even know what to say aside from, um, Ledger's solution is half-assed, um, and there's more they could do with some subset of the coins affected by that issue. And like, holy fuck, Trezor! Like, you you just for how long has the Model T been out now? For more than a year, 
you, 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 no auto lock function, which was something you had built into the original. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, there seriously needs to be some way for these companies to collaborate on standards, to make each other aware of all of the issues which affect these types of products, period, and, you know, get shit in order. Because this is just fucking ridiculous. You have these companies flinging shit, um, not being open with people disclosing issues um, constantly and bickering coming of that. And then you constantly have little things like, like this, like, oh, this basic feature that was in our first product, whoopsies, we just forgot to add that in the new one. Like, get your shit together. <sighs> Shinobi rant, done. Well, should uh, we go into someone else who made a whoopsie? Yes, and based on what you were saying before we started recording, um, I'm probably going to be flabbergasted. So we haven't really done an update on Virgil Griffith's case since about 30 episodes ago with episode 200, 201, and 202, so I thought it would be a good time to give an update on that. And basically nothing super interesting has happened yet, um, as is the case for a lot of legal stuff right now, given the lockdown. But as of the last two months or so, Virgil has basically been trying to get the case case moved to somewhere else due to his he's arguing lack of venue which is currently the u.s district court for the southern district of new york and i don't remember if we mentioned this but over the winter holiday for 2019 2020 he was actually released into home confinement in alabama pending trial um towards the end of july his defense lawyer klein requested for him to have restored access to the internet um, telling Judge Castell in a letter that while on leave from the Ethereum Foundation, another unnamed company has offered to make him a consultant, and he wanted to submit that um, that contract or offered contract in, to the court under seal um, for whatever reason why he wants it to be under seal. But yeah, um, that would be really interesting to find out what company wants to hire him as a consultant given what he's being accused of but we'll move on there is also a note uh, about the government apparently serving a search warrant to the north korean mission to the un uh, which seems to have surfaced an email between griffith and the mission um about how he sent an email to the DPRK mission located in New York on March 7th, 2019 to get a visa. And then on April 18th, 2019, the DPRK approved his travel and gave him a visa. And so they're arguing that the, the reason they got this mail so early and they're, they're talking about it is because they are saying due to the fact that that he applied for a visa um, to that mission and it was accepted and the mission is based in New York, that makes the appropriate venue New York because that is where the mission is based. And Griffith disagrees because he's saying, well, yes, he, he, he applied for the visa through the mission, but obviously the visa was not approved in New York. It was probably sent, I mean, well, definitely sent back to uh, North Korea somehow, or at least representatives of North Korea, probably not in New York to approve that. Um, the mission is just a point of contact. And so that con that's currently what they're disagreeing about. And from there, it sounds like the next case management conference will happen in October or November, if I was reading the summaries of the case by others correctly. But here is the very sticky part. Um, I haven't been able to see the original documents for some of these quotes, but there was a kind of long summary of the case up until July uh, by the Intercity, Inter Intercity Press, uh, who said that they managed to get a bunch of documents unsealed, and they claimed the following. So... Early on July 23rd, an hour before the above-tweeted conference in the case, the U.S. Attorney Office um, opposed, uh, they opposed the 
the venue changing, offering these quotes from the North Korea conference, as in quotes from what Griffith supposedly said at the conference. Uh, And so this is a quote that they include supposedly from Virgil Griffith. And he says, hello, everyone. I know it's late in the day, so I'll try to make this fun. So the most important feature of blockchain is that they are open and the DPRK can't be kept out no matter what the US or the UN says. One of the most interesting things is that blockchain allow greater self-reliance in both banking and contracts. So you can have contracts without an authority. So you heard about, and obviously he's speaking, so it's going to be a little broken um, with filler words, but he said, so you heard about block uh, about with blockchain the u.s can't stop your payments that's like that is step one and step two is the u.n can't stop agreements so if the dprk makes agreements with someone or if an individual does you can't uh you you don't have to go to a court and i have to scroll one second so yeah that was just a selected quote that they featured and it's basically him it's basically him you know kind of selling the idea of using a blockchain to these North Koreans at this conference by saying, you know, the U.S. and the U.N. can't stop you. You know, nothing particularly shocking about that, but um, I will continue because there is more quotes. Uh, Furthermore, they quote a text message, which he supposedly sent on October 2nd, 2019, uh, which I think... That would that would have been after he went to North Korea. Um, I don't actually did did we ever get I don't remember the precise date where he supposedly went, but anyway, the message he sent on October second, twenty nineteen, in an exchange with family members, noted that he might be fired from his cryptocurrency company and stated that if he was, he might instead, quote, set up a money laundering company in North Korea. What? Uh, the fuck? That is that that is not all. So one of the legal documents that I have actually seen, it looks it looks like an authentic legal document from the case, and it's actually back from January eighth of this year. I just hadn't seen it until now. Um, it's linked in the description, but that has some other text messages that the government has submitted very early on, even though the trial hasn't started or anything. And as again, as I said in the episode uh, that we first talked about this on 200, um, it's very important to keep in mind that we do not know the extent to which the government may have edited or manipulated these messages. Um, and I didn't read the entire document in full, so I didn't see any counterclaims that might have been made um, about this. But here we go. This is what is stated in the legal document. This is the government's argument. Um, and I think it was actually a tra- it was it was a transcript. Um, of conversation uh, that was happening at one of these one of these case management hearings, but the government said in another conversation, Mr. Griffith is discussing uh, the conference with another person, and that person expresses some concern for Mr. Mr. Griffith's safety, and Mr. Griffith he responds, North Korea wouldn't want to scare away blockchain talent that will let them get around sanctions, and in response, the individual says. What if they're funding their drug trade and nuclear program with crypto? And Griffith says, unlikely, but they'd probably like to start doing such. End quote. So, yeah. Blockchain and peace, people. What the fuck? Like, how fucking stupid can you be holy shit mom dad if i get fired i'm gonna launder money for north korea like are you a fucking moron holy shit yeah i mean like like i said uh from based on the legal the 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 second quote that i read from an actual legal document i haven't found the ones that inner inner city press was quoting but um it does look like they might have you know shortened some parts left some things out so to keep that in mind but given everything else we know about the case the fact that he went at all the fact that it really sounds like the united states did not give him permission to go and he went anyway the fact that he after going there came back to the u.s with all of his devices and supposedly participated in two interviews voluntarily with fbi people um the amount of naivety i am 
emphasized over and over again in the first episode where we talked about this. The amount of naivete in this case brings me to the conclusion that these quotes are probably mostly accurate. <laughs> um, and they do not surprise me somewhat because this is like a new level <laughs> of naivete, but they're, they're not out of character, unfortunately. So, yes. Um, yes. He, He's so, fucked. Yeah, I mean, this... Um, yeah, unfortunately, because, you know, one of the things we discussed when we originally talked about the case was that, you know, the, the setting the precedent that people shouldn't be able to go to countries under sanction and give speeches and that giving a speech is somehow aiding the regime, that could set a terrible precedent and we should be aware of that going forward, obviously. But if these text messages are authentic, and I don't have any reason to believe at this point that they're not, other than just you don't trust verify anything the government says, um, this is definitely evidence of intent, at least intent, to cooperate with a sanctioned uh, country and also literally admitting to wanting to set up a money laundering company. Um, that will not go well. Yeah, they're not even going to need to bring up making the speech at the conference at all. Like, that that has zero need to be involved in any argument or charge they make. Period. <laughs> He's fucked. Yeah, and um, they don't... In this particular quote that I read, they didn't specify who the family members were, but there was another quote that wasn't... I, I didn't read it off, but there was another one where it specifically says it was a text message with his mother. So, yes. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And, uh, yeah, so this definitely did not at all refute the argument that I made originally that um, all of the people, including including Vitalik claiming that he was a humanitarian mission to get to know people who have been unfairly demonized or something or other. It's like, not only was he completely not prepared or qualified to do such a thing like that, but that does not seem to be his intent whatsoever based on these messages. Yep. Like, again, there are existing projects where people are actually trying to help people in North Korea by, for example, smuggling flash drives with, with media that the state would not like into the country, or actually helping people to escape North Korea. That is actually helping people. Going to North Korea and giving a blockchain talk to basically the... 1% upper class and government of the country is not going to help anyone. Duh. Well, he'll learn that the hard way now. Oh, yeah, <sighs> I, I did tell you that <laughs> there, <laughs> there was some stuff here. Yep. I literally cannot comprehend being that stupid. Ah, <sighs> boy. All right, well, I guess you want to go through another blitz of some software releases this time? Mm-hmm. So, BTC Pay server uh, 1.0.5.4 is out, um, and it is a Bitcoin-only build by default. Um, so they've... A couple of subtle tweaks here. Uh, redesigned the, the login page to be a little more minimal redid the uh recovery phrase page for people setting up new wallets with a little more um clear instruction on how to handle the seed backup and what exactly you're doing there and then um pretty much uh, also made uh a multi-select feature in the invoices page so if you're trying to go through and uh you know, mess with invoices or export them or anything. Uh, you can do that all in one go for a batch now, which is nice. And uh, actually also two uh, security issues um, that got patched. Uh, I, di I didn't look too deeply into that, but they just looked like um, 
like um, fault injection attacks, um, like importing data into the the client and shit. But uh, yeah, woo! Shinobi's gonna have some work after we're done recording. But next up, um, Wasabi has just dropped one dot one dot twelve. And I just want to jump to this first. Um, pay join support. There is finally a proactive post mix tool in the wallet now. So fucking a. Um, and it's just a real, real simp. Uh, well, real simp. <laughs> real simple. <laughs> <laughs> copy simp. and paste. Uh, with the. Uh, the pay join endpoint and the address. Um, so you'll just get like a URI from who you're trying to pay and just paste it in there. Um, and pretty much um, when you hit send, it will pre-sign and send off a uh, normal non-pay join transaction. Um, it'll automatically do the handshake for the pay join and if successful, um, submit that to chain. If not, <clears throat> it'll just fall back to the regular transaction. And so like, I, I cannot stress enough. Finally, some fucking post mix tools because that is just structurally always been one of the biggest weak points of this wallet. And then aside from that, um, they've made some tour upgrades on the back end that should help make connections more reliable. And they're also supporting um, a version four of their backend, um, which they're going to be upgrading to soon. So anybody um, using this right now, um, you pretty much have until whatever version or whatever time period they update their backend to update to at least this version, which supports um, the new and previous backend API. Um, and they're going to just make a hard cut um, when they upgrade. So by that point, you will need to upgrade to at least this to communicate with their backend. And also just a, a few changes um, in terms of like optimizations on the backend, um, you know, fixed a DOS attack, um, an issue um, where clients got banned um, if things didn't... Um, get accepted into the mempool and just some optimizations like that. But <clears throat> yeah, mostly I, I am happy to see some post mix tools finally get into this. And now the work begins to get the other page join implementations to all work together and be nice and not scream at each other. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, BTC pay um, is a nice thing on that front, you know, especially with all all the merchants popping up for shit. Um, there's a decent chance out there that you can find a pay server that works properly with it. Um, that was the uh, the spec that they implemented. All right, and then uh, last up in the new software, um, Lightning Labs has dropped um, Lightning Terminal. Um, pretty much a new. Um, I don't know, graphical interface for operating your node, um, kind of similar to um, real-time lightning or um, what's the other one? Um, Thunderhub, I think, is the other one. Um, but yeah, it's just to actually handle a lot of back-end um, operations without having to go clunk around in the command line. And importantly, um, what the tools first integrating graphically is uh, loop in and loop out support. Um, so this should be a major help for anybody regularly receiving money um, who doesn't want to close the channel and keep reusing it. Prior to this, the only real way to use uh, loop was command line tinkering. And this is just a real simple select the channels that you want, uh, click loop out and how much you want to loop out and done. So this should be very nice for uh, node managers in terms of lowering the uh, the technical skills bar to actually jump into that. All right, so what's up next? Something something nobody cares about? 
Yeah, so you all may remember that way back in October 2018, I started a very long Twitter thread about the Consensus Back Civil uh, project, which was running a block uh, journalism on the blockchain type scheme and how it was way overhyped. And I've talked about it numerous times on Block Digest, including episodes 131, 132, 133, 140, and 169. And despite the fact that I clearly talked about them very often and have been following their failure to do anything close to useful since then, I actually managed to miss the fact that they closed shop in February. So in a statement that now fills the entire main page of the website when you go to it, um, the CEO of Civil, Matthew Ills, wrote, It's with a heavy heart that I announced the end of Civil. The Civil team and technology will be joining Consensus to build identity solutions on Ethereum. In 2016, Civil was founded on a moonshot mission to create a blockchain-based media platform for trustworthy journalism owned and operated by the public, which I explained in detail why that was not even was not even a moonshot it was actually worse uh we set out to decentralize how the news is vetted how journalism is funded and how we stay informed as a society among the first startups in the world to experiment with blockchain and cryptocurrencies in the media space no you were not mm -mm. no 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 i also explained how that was a lie <laughs> because wikileaks was using bitcoin and accepting bitcoin several years before you even existed um, but anyway continue with the quote we built innovative technology, supported award-winning journalists, and inspired many people all over the world with our vision for a more participatory media landscape, but ultimately we failed to sustain ourselves independently. Yes, that does happen when you just suck up to Joseph Lubin. Uh, several months ago, we started to develop products related to decentralized identity in the media and advertising space, which attracted enterprise interests for use cases such as trackable content licensing and transparent ad decisioning okay this this pivot led to closer coordination with consensus and the team building solutions for identity and provenance tracking In turn started conversations about a strategic merger we are excited to share that the civil team and technology will join consensus to be part of these efforts. Um, side note, the funny thing here is that consensus, uh, consensus basically owned and operated everything that Civil ever did. It ran Infura. It owns Infura, which is what Civil was using to run their Ethereum node. They, also the IPFS nodes that they supposedly were going to use but never actually got around to using. They didn't even host their own documents using IPFS. Like, what, there was a document that the CEO, the CEO guy once tweeted out that was on a Google Doc, and it's like, why aren't you doing that on IPFS? Um, just to you know show you can and not look like someone who just uses Google for everything. Um, yeah. Anyway, although the journey for Civil is over, our new team continues to develop cutting edge tech, cutting edge technology that I believe will contribute to building a better internet. Okay, so he thinks that we're going to build a better internet with trackable uh trackable media okay um i don't see that but anyway i can't hold it anymore you hear that Vinny? civil's coming for you civic suck it i mean that that's part of the funny thing is sometimes i would talk about civil and people would think i was talking about civic because they are so close in name and now it turns out yeah <laughs> i'd actually i actually didn't think about that but yes that makes that that is going to be funny um anyway this isn't the outcome we had envisioned but nevertheless we're proud of what we accomplished which was nothing and we couldn't have done it without the support of our passionate community. Um, well, to be fair, they did accomplish something. They did funnel um, a significant portion of Joseph Lubin's money into some journalist outlets like, apparently, Azerbaijan News. Well, they I don't know if they got money, but they were on the registry. And also the Denver Outpost and something like that. Um, yeah, so Joseph Lubin paid for some journalism. And it was much more expensive than it should have been and didn't benefit as many people as it could have. But anyway, he also notes that the civil registry, civil tokens, and other work are open source and operational, but there will be no further active development or management on our part. 
Uh, and if you know anything about Ethereum stuff and how well that stuff stands up <laughs> over time, especially with no maintenance, I'm sure that's going to go well. Uh, the Civil Foundation's future is uncertain, but it is effectively in hibernation for now, uh, which I also don't know what, what he means by these things will remain operational because actually they so they have a Twitter account called Civil Registry Alerts, and it basically tweets out whenever a new uh, newsroom opens by some media organization and uh they have only had one entity join the civil registry since february when they shut down and the new entity was i can't even remember but it looked like one of those kind of pr newswire type websites where they just copy press releases or copy other people's content and actually the the last one to join around the time that they shut down was um basically the propaganda outlet for the azerbaijani government so yeah good on them for that um second while i scroll i just randomly thought of something from like four stories back oh my god what couldn't ledger just implement bip 85 and just isolate the stupid shit coins on their own seeds entirely and just totally fix that entire problem <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry yes. to derail. Yeah, so also I didn't try to navigate their website to see if you could still because they had this whole like feed that was aggregating articles that were supposedly being published the civil system. Um and it was kind of funny because one of the things that they kind of hyped up was that the partners of civil and organizations and newsrooms who use civil when you went to actually read the article they would have this badge on it that would basically say like hey this has been fact checked but obviously that's a worthless badge because like just because you have a badge on your page that says it's been fact checked doesn't mean much when you have a system that's run by so few people um, and could be basically 51% attacked by consensus. Um, not really valuable, but I, uh, when I went through the feed and actually tried to find websites that they supposedly were working with that should have had this badge, I found one or two out of like a dozen, you know? So that didn't work out very well, but yeah. So in conclusion, I wish them just as much success in building out these identity products or advertising products for consensus as they had with Civil, if you get my drift. Um, also, I noticed that they emphasize that, you know, there's a lot of enterprise interest. And as we know, with all things Ethereum, enterprise is where dumb ideas go to get a few million dollars and then fade out of relevance in the long term. Ah, oh boy. But yeah, that is all. Civil is dead, and no one really cares. Ah, boy. Imagine well, that. They were trying to get $25 million for this thing. This is what happens when you legitimize scams as innovators and risk takers. Ah, man. All right, so... Guess I could characterize these last two things as two pieces of popcorn. You hungry? Mm-hmm. Um, so I missed this, um, but apparently a while back, um, the insane, um, disconnected from reality lawsuit against Tether and Bitfinex for a trillion dollars of damages because my market manipulation my tether printer um was amended um to include bitrex and poloniex as co-defendants and um actually pointed at two specific addresses um on the bitcoin chain um and s just s spun this delusional like tale of these are special addresses that like 
Bitrax and Poloniax are honoring like these fake tether deposits too. And you can tell that there's some shady special deal because addresses are being reused and they don't do that. So there's clearly some arrangement and conspiracy between Bitfinex, Bitrax, and Poloniax to engage in pumping the whole market with tethers printed out of thin air. And um, <clears throat> Bitrax and Poloniax just filed a... Uh, um a request for summary judgment pretty much um, under the argument that those two addresses are a private individual who arbitrage trades between those two exchanges. And they're asking for the ability to um, file sealed documents um, to only release redacted publicly because of their um, need to maintain customer confidentiality um, and asking for a summary judgment to throw the case out based on that. <laughs> Whoops. I think they took a few too many hits and went too far into unicorn land. So, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be interesting. And um, I'm betting, given the insane nature of this case, that the judge will probably grant the request to file that um, sealed and not release this person's information to verify it. And if it checks out, um, I think the odds are astronomically high that this whole case gets tossed out as bullshit because the plaintiffs just pretty much got caught red-handed um concocting a completely baseless um deranged conspiracy theory to explain this and then um you know assuming that this is not an elaborate scam from these three exchanges um there is incontrovertible evidence that that claim is false so Bye bye. Oops. All right. And last piece of popcorn. Um, so Bitmain, and by Bitmain, I am saying Jihan's half of Bitmain, um, announced. Fuck your mother part of <laughs> Bitmain. Um, he, he announced on the 6th that. Um, all orders for the June to July period um, are delayed until September and October. And that customers have two choices here. Um, either um, they can, after 60 days, um, if they haven't received their equipment, apply for a refund. Um, or um, after the 11th day um, past the quoted original ship date, um, Bitmain will start calculating the theoretical revenue um, from running that and pay that out um, for the period of the delay. Um, <clears throat> I can think of literally no way that this doesn't drag Bitmain's balance sheet deeper and deeper into giant clusterfuck land. Um, unless he's pretty much mining with those during that time. So, yeah. Hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money. Life is bad, Jihan. Alrighty, though, I think that is a wrap for the day. What do we got in terms of final thoughts rattling around? Uh, well, just, uh, Something that I was reading over the uh, end of the week, which was a article published by our friends at BitFury Crystal Blockchain, where they wrote about uh, how much Bitcoin is considered dormant. And I think their definition of that was that it hasn't moved since the beginning of 2015. And basically their article is about how much is dormant, why it might be dormant, where it came from, who might own it, um, and things like that. And in the conclusion, um, something that they state is that uh, is the following. The approximated amount from the dark net lying in the dormant balances, they calculated to be, I think, 1.5, 1. 1. 1.6 billion is quite high. The active use of mixers between 2015 and 2016 was unexpected, but this can be explained by the growth and popularity of blockchain analytics services like Chris Blockchain. The growth in the popularity of mixing services among Bitcoin users was likely due to a fear of revealing the source of funds in their wallets. 
Um, I mean, that last sentence is a bit iffy, but I found it quite hilarious that they are basically trying to claim credit for, or partial credit for the growing popularity in mixers during 2015 and 2016 when, um, hmm, checks notes, uh, they didn't exist until January 2018. So that's a bit awkward. Also, given the fact that in their launch paper for Crystal, they kind of tried to imply that they had invented clustering or that clustering was new when that was not the case. And also the privacy issues with their with Bitfury's Lightning Peach project that we discovered last year and how, you know, bad and mis uh, very confusing that was, and also the fact that when I asked Bitfury people at the Lightning Conference in, I think it was September 2018, um, about whether there was a conflict of interest between their development of Lightning apps, which should improve privacy in Bitcoin, and their development of blockchain surveillance tools for law enforcement that would obviously not benefit from privacy in Bitcoin, their response to me was to talk about the importance of KYC. So basically not answer the question. <laughs> wah, wah. I guess my final thought is going to be um, just something I forgot to mention during um, talking about Coin Center's letter to the comptroller because I was so infuriated. Oh yeah, another part of the node operations section is um, how running a node will help banks gather information on their customers to comply with KYC laws. So yeah, they're pretty much, um, you know, go, like, hey, banks, go run your own chain analysis stuff. You know, that's real great. Yeah. But yeah. I guess on that note, um, hope you enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. Bye. <laughs>